Right Show. Welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I am the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and I've recorded more than 5,000 interviews going back to 2003, all of which are available at scotthorton.org. We can also sign up for the podcast feed. The full archive is also available at youtube.com slash Show. All right, you guys, introducing Vincent Bevins, and uh, he wrote about Brazil for the L.A. Times and Indonesia for the Washington Post, and he's got this brand new book out, The Jakarta Method, Washington's Anti-Communist Crusade and the Mass Murder Program that Shaped Our World. And unfortunately, I just don't have the time to read the thing right now. I'm very busy. But uh, I did read this great excerpt. Uh, adapted from it um, at the New York Review of Books. That's nybooks.com. It's called How Jakarta Became the Code Word for U.S.-Backed Mass Killing. Welcome back to the show, Vincent. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. And, uh, yeah, I'm really sorry. I don't have time to get to the whole book right now. but uh, That's fine. I, I really do appreciate the work that you've done here. Um, and, and what an important article this is here at the New Yorker Via Books. It's, I don't know, 5,000 words or something. Definitely worth taking a look at here. And uh, two dirty wars, really, against the Reds during the Cold War in the 1960s here um, in Indonesia and in Brazil. And so you kind of tell the story through the eyes of uh, people who lived through it and, in fact, had traveled uh, from Indonesia and emigrated from Indonesia to Brazil. And so we're kind of tied up in a way in uh, both. So if you want to take that angle, that'd be fine. Or if you want to uh, just kind of zoom out and talk a little bit more about the the kind of larger overview of the Cold War and the purpose of it all, or whichever angle you want to start with is fine. Sure, yeah. In this, in this book, um, I tell the story of the U.S.-backed, intentional mass murder of approximately 1 million innocent civilians in Indonesia. And this is one of the most important turning points of the Cold War, um, definitely far more important than Vietnam, I think might have been the greatest quote unquote victory for Washington um, as it perceived its, uh, its goals in the Cold War. And this victory was so obvious to um, allies of the United States, other right-wing regimes, potential allies of the United States, that they learned from the tactics that were that were employed very horribly in Indonesia. And most famously in, in Brazil and Chile, they had the deployment of the word Jakarta to signify mass murder as something that they were going to do to the left in order to make, um, in order to solidify the right-wing authoritarian regimes that took shape during the Cold War. And yeah, as you said, um, to, to write this book, I, I traveled around the world and I met a lot of people that lived through this. And I tried to find the people who, 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 whose personal stories could really bring home what really happened and how it affected life um, in all these countries. And I found, I found through the research and, and through meeting these people that in at least 20 countries, um, U.S. allied regimes carried out intentional mass murder programs to kill leftists or accuse leftists. And I think that this was such an important part of the way that the West won the Cold War that it ended up shaping the type of globalization that we ended up getting in the, in the early 21st century. And I'm in, I'm in Sao Paulo now, and I could, I could certainly tell you that we here in Brazil feel the long consequences of the, of the violence of the Cold War. And I think this is true in a lot of countries, especially in the developing world, but also in, in the, in the first world as well, the relationship between the rich world and the, the developing world is, is one that has been profoundly shaped by this violence in a way that I think has really been overlooked, um, in the last, since the end of the cold war, partially because these things took place so far from the sort of headline grabbing, uh, quagmires that actually involved American civilians like Vietnam or the sort of embarrassing uh, and uh, explosive direct confrontations with the Soviet Union like in, uh, in, in Cuba or in Berlin. But for the vast majority of human beings on planet Earth, uh, 
the Cold War was not about those the small little direct conflicts with between Moscow and Washington. It was between it was about the conflicts conflicts between the formerly colonized world, uh, what used to be called the Third World, um, and at the time the that term was entirely optimistic. It, it was meant to signify that the peoples of the formerly colonized world would be able to take their place on the world stage. Um, and it was the, the conflict between the third world and the first world, I think, is the one that is was most important in the in the Cold War. And that is the one that I try to tell um, centering the massacre of Indonesia as one of the most important events, because I think it it can be easily considered as important as anything else. Yeah. Well, and as you say, uh, it's pretty easy to go under the radar when compared to Vietnam, even though, hey, a third of the casualties is still a lot <laughs> compared to, you know, Vietnam was a lot to compare to a million dead. Um, but if it was all by proxy and it was all by CIA payoffs and briefcases and this kind of thing, then that means that 60 Minutes may have covered part of it once or something at most, but this was never... Um, you know, a big deal. In fact, this is part of that documentary about Noam Chomsky, right? Of manufacturing consent, where they take the New York Times um, uh, column inches that they spent on the auto genocide in Cambodia and right. column inches spent on the auto genocide in Indonesia going on right around the same right. time or East, East relatively Timor, right. the same time and, and compare the agenda setting media and which one they want you to care about and which one they rather sweep under the rug. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's just a function of the. I mean, I've I spent all of my adult life as a as a correspondent working for mainstream corporate media in the United States, and all of the skills I have as a journalist, for better or worse, um, come from that experience. But I mean, I know how it works, and I and I know why it would be that um, narratives which very violently conflict with our idea our idea of who we are as a country and what the Cold War was just kind of end up not really fitting. So, in the. Uh, you, in the case of Indonesia 1965, there was a, a brief moment of coverage in the Western press and the New York Times. There was a, a very celebratory column, a basically a, a euphoric recounting of the way that the largest communist party outside of the Soviet Union in China was eliminated and, and, and one of the biggest prizes in the Cold War flipped overnight almost, mm. um, almost well, importantly, without any as cost. You, yeah. As you point out here that the leader in charge was part of the non-aligned movement and was not a communist. And so it wasn't yeah, was, a matter of overthrowing a communist government. It was a matter of overthrowing a neutral government and then destroying a communist party that had not yet achieved power, right? Yes, and this is something that's very poorly understood, I think, in, in the English language understanding of the Cold War. Sukarno was not only just a member of the non-aligned movement, he was one of the, found, he was one of the founding and driving forces between, behind this um, movement to create a path for countries that did not want to align directly with the United States. Um, they were often very skeptical of what the United States was really up to after, you know, hundreds of years under um, white, white European colonialism, watching the way that the United States was acting in, in other countries, they were very hesitant to, to join up completely, but they also didn't want to join up with the Soviet Union. And what is too often excluded from our memory of the Cold War is that starting with the... Um, Eisenhower administration, and then basically for the rest of the Cold War. Anyone that was neutral, that tried to maintain some kind of independence, that did not join an explicit alliance with the United States, was viewed as potentially a threat and whose, whose, whose violent overthrow could be justified. So the mass murder of the Communist Party, which by the way, it should be stressed, was an unarmed and very moderate party. I mean, they always believed that you had to develop capitalism in a broad alliance with the rest of Indonesia, and then the, maybe you would transition to socialism in 40 or 50 years. The Communist Party was eliminated not because they were in power, but because they were part of the support base for President Sukarno. And so they had to be killed so that the transition to the U.S.-backed um, dictator Suharto could be carried out, right? If they had not destroyed the supporters of the left-leaning but independent government and terrified all of the family members and friends of those that had been killed, it would have been impossible to actually transition to this very pro-Washington, very violent, and very dictatorial Suharto regime. Yeah. Now, so, um, well, tell us a little bit about Sukarno and, uh, and how the coup took place against him. 
Yeah, so Sukarno came up um, in the anti-colonial struggle against the Dutch. So Indonesia, maybe we should just, you know, stress is the fourth largest country in the world by population. It consists of the Dutch colonies in Asia. It's um, 13,000 or 15,000 or 18,000 islands, depending on the tide, basically. Uh, a huge uh, constellation of ethnicities and languages and cultures. And Sukarno came up in the early 20th century in this milieu in which opposition to European colonialism brought everyone together. And the main forces um, that we were united against this colonialism were Marxism, Islam, and anti-colonial nationalism. And he kind of brought all these brought all these uh, disparate elements together and forged this kind of national identity, which was explicitly anti-imperialist and explicitly about independence from the colonial world. And in the first years of the Cold War, after um, him and the independence forces succeeded in expelling the Dutch, the Dutch tried to reconquer from 1945 to 1949. We forget often that the Europeans came back in a lot of cases and tried to get back their colonies. Just, you know, we the, the U.S. government helped France to, in this attempt, which is why so many people in the region were so skeptical of, of U.S. Um, intentions in the region. And in the beginning of the Cold War, Sukarno was seen as somebody that could be dealt with by the Washington foreign policy establishment. He was seen as somebody that was sufficiently anti-communist. He was at least keeping the communists in check. And he made it very clear that he wanted to have good relations with the United States, which he really did. Now, two things happened in the 1950s which caused the people in Washington to change their mind. Number one, the Indonesian Communist Party keeps doing better, better, better and better in elections. And we know now from declassified files um, and from CIA reports that it was understood in Washington that the reason they were doing better and better was because they were popular and they were doing uh, you know, effective outreach to the people in the countryside, in the cities. It was, it was not a trick, it was not coercion, they were just winning. And this really alarmed people in Washington. And number two, Sukarno brought together the countries of the third world at something called the Afro-Asian Conference, um, or the Bandung Conference in 1955. And this was this explicit attempt to forge an alliance between all the countries of the formerly colonized world to create a path that was independent of the United States and the Soviet Union. And even though they tried very hard at this conference to make it clear that to the United States that they wanted to maintain a friendship, they they even invoked the legacy of Paul Revere at the conference to sort of try to appeal to this revolutionary history in the United States to say like, hey, hey, we're doing what you did. You know, we're we just want to be our own country, just like you wanted to be free of the British. That didn't matter. Um, the success of the Communist Party and Sukarno's very loud anti-colonial, anti-imperial posture caused the CIA to unleash uh, a number of attempts to destroy his government or to, to crush the left or to even break apart Indonesia. And it was only uh, in 1965 that the third attempt finally succeeded. The, thir the third and final attempts to crush the left involved mass murder. But first, they tried just paying, just giving money to right-wing Muslim parties. They tried that in the middle of the 50s. That didn't work. In 1958, the CIA started bombing the country in what was the CIA's largest ever oper operation to that point. So again, this is very forgotten, but in 57 and 58, the CIA backed rebels um, out on the outer islands, quote-unquote. So in, in there were sort of regional, there were regions of Indonesia that were trying to break off or stand up to the central government. And the CIA just started bombing the country and, and killing civilians. And an American pilot was caught in 1958, a man named Alan Pope. And so this was the second attempt, which totally failed. And then the US reorganized, recalibrated, to instead of fight directly the Indonesian army, to train them and to try to, try to create a sort of anti-communist, pro-American ideological hegemony within the armed forces. And by 1965, as Sukarno has picked another fight with the West, which is seen as a uh, the last straw, and a clash erupts between the, the unarmed Communist Party and the very well-armed armed forces in 1965, the State Department and clandestine services, CIA and MI6, although we still don't know exactly what CIA and MI6 did, they very enthusiastically back the army as they violently crush this unarmed, very popular communist party. Probably 25, 30% of the country was somehow affiliated. And they were so easy to kill precisely because they were a nonviolent party.
And in a matter of six to 12 months, they're entirely eliminated. Not a single American is hurt. And the largest country in Southeast Asia is flipped from a vocal anti-imperialist nation that is trying to unite the brown and black peoples of the world into a reliable ally of the United States. And as you say, for the rest of the Cold War, whatever Suharto is doing gets a pass from Washington in 1975. They invade East Timor on the pretense of anti-communism and kill uh, approximately a third of that country, which is larger percentage of the population than Pol Pot killed in 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 Cambodia. And, and as you rightly point out, we all know about Pol Pot, but very few people know about Suharto or the fact that he was on our side. Hey guys, Scott Horton here for Mike Swanson's great book, The War State. It's about the rise of the military industrial complex and the power elite after World War II during the administrations of Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, and Jack Kennedy. It's a very enlightening take on this definitive era on America's road to world empire. The War State by Mike Swanson. Find it in the right-hand margin at scotthorton.org. Hey, y'all, Mike Swanson is a successful Wall Street trader with an Austrian school understanding of the markets, and therefore he has great advice to share with you. Check out Mike's work and sign up for his list at wallstreetwindow.com. And that's what you'll get, a window into all of Mike's trades. He'll explain what he's buying and selling and expecting and why. I know you'll learn and earn a lot. Wallstreetwindow.com. That's wallstreetwindow.com. And so when you say the CIA was bombing the place, I mean, this is what the, an original version of Air America, kind of deniable airlines, or yeah, so they're using they were, the Air Force planes? And they're, what kind of airstrikes are we talking about? They were taken out from Singapore. They were American pilots. Um, and they were they were dropping bombs on on Indonesian islands. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a good question. I, I have it in my notes, but I, I, like whose planes they were, I'm not sure. But it was it was not it was not like it was not the kind of more sophisticated uh, deniability that you got later in the Cold War, where you had you know you made sure that there was no American pilots getting caught. I mean, there was a guy named Alan Pope who was caught. He crash landed in the island of, of Ambon with his identifying papers on him. Uh, and this was seen as proof to the forces within Indonesia, especially on the left, that had been saying for from 1945 to 1958, we can't trust the Americans. They want to destroy our country. These people were proved right. So at this moment, Indonesia moves closer to the Soviet Union, but still never never allies uh, with the communist bloc. Sukarno always uh, insists on independence. But this was a, an actual aerial bombardment uh, with several American uh, pilots. You know, you could read, you could read them sort of their, their memoirs talking about this, bragging about this, saying, you know, I, I killed a lot of people, but they were communists, so that's fine. And um, this was based on what they had done in Guatemala in 1954. They were trying to replicate the success they had had in Guatemala in 1954. And, uh, success. Yeah, I mean, they, this was a huge, you know, the CIA, when the CIA was first created, uh, right after World War II ended, they struggled for years to actually crack the Soviet bloc, right? They, they sent people parachuting into Eastern Europe. All these people were captured. Uh, they were they were totally ineffective at actually taking on the communist world. But when they turned to the quote unquote third world, they had quote unquote success. So in Iran in 1953, Guatemala in 1954, this was seen as the Eisenhower administration as like, oh, we cracked the code. We can flip countries to our side with no with no cost. And in Indonesia, this failed and it failed very obviously. So they ended up in um, entirely changing tactics, bringing thousands of Indonesian military officers to train in Kansas. And one of the, the, the main characters uh, in my book, um, um, and I end up dedicating the book to him because he, he passed away last year, he was also brought to Kansas to study economics. So he, he recounts what it was like to sort of go out in Kansas in the 50s, drinking with these Indonesian officers, going to strip clubs, and sort of recounting what he believes they were actually brought to America for. And he says that they were brought to America so that they could be kind of paid to be to become loyal anti-communist uh, allies. And when the mass murder program starts, two of the people that are most responsible for really putting it into practice on the ground 
both uh, studied in Kansas in the 1950s. Now, in your article, you brought up the name David Rockefeller, and I was wondering if you could be more specific about Chase Manhattan Bank interests in Indonesia at the time. Is this all tied up with the uh, gold in West Papua, or is there more to it than that? Yeah, so the... So the, the gold in West Papua was found after um, immediately after a U.S. A, a corporate interest um, sort of stream into Indonesia. So I think what you might be re- talk, referring to are you talk, uh, so the Rockefellers are involved in 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 uh, different ways and in, in the major um, coups that take place in in the book. So in Brazil, Chile certainly, and in Indonesia, I believe what happens is. I mentioned that the Rockefellers stream in um, as part of this major business conference that takes place in Jakarta as one million innocent Indonesians are still held in concentration camps. So they killed approximately one million people. Another million are are held in anti-left concentration camps for over a decade. But while this is happening, all of the big companies in the United from the United States stream in to have sort of business conferences celebrating that Indonesia is open for Western uh, capitalism. Now, the gold issue is very interesting, but that's discovered after. What was very important to U.S. officials and to U.S. corporations in the during the moment of the actual mass murder, and it's going to sound like a cliche, but it's the same thing, it was oil, right? So even while the killings were happening, the United States government was able to put effective pressure on General Suharto to make sure that Indonesian oil, um, the Indonesian oil industry would be would remain open to foreign investment and not be nationalized, as was the the initial plan. Hmm. And now um, I wanted to ask you about really the first thing I ever learned about this was from Christopher Hitchens movie, the trials of Henry Kissinger back in the 1990s, where he talked about during the Ford administration, this same exact kind of thing happened again and again with a green light from the U S to the Indonesian right to crack down. Maybe that was over, uh, East Timor, East East Timor. Okay. Exactly. So East, like if you, the book, the book tries to tell in a very, concise and accessible way the, the history of the whole Cold War but you know sort of it, it says what 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 if you told the, the history of the Cold War but with Indonesian massacre as the central event and what if you told the story of the Cold War with the people that lived through this violence in in Brazil and Chile and Indonesia as the main characters of the Cold War and doing that um, it becomes very clear that there's no there's no president that is not involved in, in or responsible for some really horrible stuff. So the second half of the 70s, when you have uh, Ford and Jimmy Carter, this is the period when Suhardo carries out the invasion of and mass murder of approximately one third of East Timor. Um, then then uh, Vietnam invades Cambodia to liberate that country from the Khmer Rouge in 1979. Jimmy Carter agrees with China that China should invade Vietnam to punish them for this. That invasion is forgotten because it was such a a failure. But then after that, the United States takes the side of the Khmer Rouge in, for the rest of the Cold War. So the United States at that point, become, at that point becomes uh, a defender of the Khmer Rouge's right to represent Cambodia at That's the That's right, United folks. <laughs> for, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, for the first time you ever learn that, it's a lot of fun. Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan both backed Pol Pot, yep. didn't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, from it, there, there was this brief moment when, absolutely, from 1975 to 1979, a quote unquote communist regime was carrying out terrible atrocities. Although the actual communists in the in the countries nearby didn't, once they found out what was really happening, they you know stormed in to stop it. Um, of course, they had their own reasons, but it was this brief period when, absolutely, yes, we were not on the side of the the Cambodian Khmer Rouge regime from 75 to 79 when they carried out these horrible, horrible. Um, human rights abuses are much worse than that that we all know about. But what we don't, people don't realize is that things before that were very bad in Cambodia. When because in Cambodia, in 1970, the United States backed a a coup of Prince Sihanouk, who had who was a Sukarno-like figure in that he was trying to maintain independence uh, and neutrality. But this was very very difficult with the Vietnam War happening 
on his border. Uh, the South Vietnamese government tried to kill him. The CIA tried to overthrow him. He was loudly proclaiming that the CIA was trying to kill him, and everybody called him a wild conspiracy theorist, but it turned out he was totally right. So in 1970, the U.S. did back a coup in Cambodia and installed Lan Nol. And the period in which he was the, the running Cambodia and the United States was bombing the countryside was horrible. So 1970 to 75 was horrible. And then after uh, Pol Pot actually leaves, then we, you know, or the U.S. government, insists that the Khmer Rouge is the legitimate representative of, of Cambodia at the at United Nations and keeps sort of a, a small contingent of them active on the Thai border, kind of in a way trying to contest Vietnamese control over that country. So in this region, like it's uh, it's very hard to look at the United States and be like, oh, well, that was the that was the point when they were good here. There's not there's no like little gap where things were where the U.S. behaved in a in a way that was uh, that would correspond to the ideals that we profess. Yeah, I mean, this was never about good versus evil. It was just about who had the dominance. There's a great clip of Ike Eisenhower saying, now listen, if the Reds get control in Vietnam, we might have to pay the market price for tungsten. And that is yeah. just intolerable. I mean, this kind yeah. of thing, cynical calculations about, you know, pennies on the dollar for minerals. I mean, what if we'd had to buy tungsten from the Reds all along? Think of all the money yeah. we would have saved. <laughs> instead of trying to steal it and killing three million people. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a quote from George Cannon, which might be interesting for me to read. George Cannon, one of the architects of the Cold War in 1948, he says, and I quote, We have about 50% of the world's wealth, but only 6.3% of its population. This disparity is particularly great as between ourselves and the peoples of Asia. In this situation, we cannot fail to be the object of envy and resentment. Our real task in this coming period is to devise a pattern of relationships which will permit us to maintain this position of disparity without positive detriment to our national security. So basically saying like, we have way, we have, we run the world's economy and obviously this isn't fair. So we have to figure a way to crush opposition to this situation. And, you know, I, when I moved to, to Southeast Asia in 2017, like, you know, these people understand this, you know, they understand the, the relationship between the, the white world and the, and these parts of Asia, you know, they had hundreds of years of, of direct colonial, uh, domination. And if you ask a lot of people now, they'll say, oh no, you know, the United States took over and they occupied a, a position which was very similar. You want to call it neo-colonial, you want to call it, you know, violent hegemony, whatever, whatever, is the vocabulary that you use it's very they, they understood what was happening yeah of course it's a damnable lie that the american people's standard of living depends on this imperialism that's not right the american government's position of dominance over other governments and their ability to pull the strings for favored corporations like say rockefeller interests in indonesia for example no question about that but um you know, it's yeah. sort of like cops hiding behind racism for their brutality. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. No, the American people, how would they ever feed their children if we weren't butchering Indonesians? You know, you might as well yeah. say that we're dependent on the phase of Saturn in the sky. Uh, there's no correlation there whatsoever. Yeah. So, Just like, I make, that point, yeah, I make that point at the very end of the book. Like, I compare, I look at, you know, how, because I said, you know, I spent a lot of time meeting these people in, in, from Indonesia, especially, but South America and around the world. And one of the most moving things and one of the most tragic moments of this research was when, when I would ask them about their political lives and their political beliefs in the 50s and 60s. And when they would explain to me what they believed then, th that the world would be like now, like you could see their, their eyes light up and, and they were just kind of like, this world that they believed that they were going to get once direct imperial control uh, ended, they they thought that they were going to take their place alongside the the rich Western world. And at the end of the book, I look at how, in a very uh, concrete and quantifiable way, this did not happen at all. Almost no country, no large country in the quote unquote third world, act, um, actually caught up with the rich world since 1945. And so, what I make the point at the very end of the book that as as a, as a country, as a national unit, the United States benefited from this dynamic. But that doesn't mean that the average person did. It means that 
certain sectors of the U.S. did, and those are the sectors which have the most control over over the government. It's not you don't have to be a radical to recognize that right. powerful economic interests have more control over the U.S. government than you know um, marginalized communities or in you know or you know just just the or just the average Joe, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, half of the country, right? Yeah. Hold on just one second. Be right back. So you're constantly buying things from Amazon.com. Well, that makes sense. They bring it right to your house. So what you do, though, is click through from the link in the right-hand margin at scotthorton.org, and I'll get a little bit of a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. Won't cost you a thing. Nice little way to help support the show. Again, that's uh, right there in the margin at scotthorton.org. Hey, y'all, check it out. The Libertarian Institute, that's me and my friends, have published three great books this year. First is No Quarter, The Ravings of William Norman Grigg. He was the best one of us. Now he's gone, but this great collection is a truly fitting legacy for his fight for freedom. I know you'll love it. Then there's Coming to Palestine by the great Sheldon Richman. It's a collection of 40 important essays he's written over the years about the truth behind the Israel-Palestine conflict. You'll learn so much and highly value this definitive libertarian take on the dispossession of the Palestinians and the reality of their brutal occupation. And last but not least is the great Ron Paul, the Scott Horton Show interviews 2004 through 2019, interview transcripts of all of my interviews of the good doctor over the years on all the wars, money, taxes, the police state, and more. So how do you like that? Pretty good, right? Find them all at libertarianinstitute.org slash books. You need stickers for your band or your business? Well, Rick and the guys over at thebumpersticker.com have got you covered. Great work, great prices, sticky things with things printed on them. Whatever you need, thebumpersticker.com will get it done right for you. Thebumpersticker.com. So uh, take us over to the Brazil side of this because I think, um, you know what? I'm going to tell you a story that I only just thought of. I'm glad I did. I hadn't thought of this in a while. But I know a guy. Um, I knew a guy. A long time ago, on my first radio right. show, Free Radio Austin, 1998 and 1999. And I saw this guy again in 2001 or two or somewhere around there. And he told me the story of his September 11th. And what had happened mm -hmm. was he was down on, in Brazil. I don't remember if it was in Rio or in Sao Paulo, uh, one or the other. And it was like a scene out of one of those 1950s movies uh, or something where... People would gather on the sidewalk outside the department store window to watch the TV news or the right. breaking news. You know what I mean? You see those right. scenes? And it was just like that. Uh, September mm -hmm. 11th, the towers are burning, and all the people are gathered around on the sidewalk watching it burn. And he was there with them, and he said they were all not celebrating, um, you know, like whooping or clapping or anything like that. But they were doing that thing where it's like that little fist pump where you kind of hold your fist close to your chest and go, yeah. Yeah. And they were all going, yeah. yeah. And he was like, well, what the hell? What did America ever do to Brazil? How <laughs> yeah, could these right. people sit there and say, now you know what it feels like? And they're not. Iraqis that we've been bombing from bases in Saudi Arabia for 10 years? They're the Brazilians. And of course, the answer is America done a hell of a lot to them. But nothing yeah. that the American people have any idea about, Vincent. Yeah, it's not... Um, I mean, this is the really the big contradiction because, you know, when people are like, well, how do we not know about this? Well, it's like, you know, if you're going to have a, a, a government which is hegemonic or imperialist or, or somehow involved in almost the, the affairs of almost every country in the world... It's very difficult to have that in democracy at the same time, right? Because the average American has a lot going on in their own lives. How are they supposed to keep track of what it is that the U.S. government is doing in 180 countries, right? I mean, there's there's limited amounts of attention that we can give to U.S. foreign policy, but it's it's basically happening everywhere. And it's really interesting that you bring up September 11th because September 11th is the day that the CIA eventually succeeded in overthrowing Salvador Allende and installing Augusto Pinochet. Right. So September 11th, 1973 is the day in which the Jakarta method was implemented in Chile. So maybe I'll just explain how Jakarta came to South America and what that actually meant in, in the early 70s. So the U.S. The US backed um, – coup in 1964 in Brazil was probably, as I, as I claim that the Indonesian 
mass murder was the most quote un, the most important quote unquote success in, in Asia. I think that Brazil in 1964 was the most important success in the Western Hemisphere, precisely because it was um, it was more subtle. There was there was no no need for a uh, obvious and catastrophic intervention. There was a long collaboration between the U.S. government and the Brazilian military. The Brazilian military largely did it on their own. The U.S. government made um, military equipment available to the Brazilian military, but they ended up not needing it. They got the they got sufficient support among the the, the officers here and among the the elite to, to to carry out the coup on their own. Then in 1970, Salvador Allende is elected uh, president of Chile. And now what we know again from declassified files for um, from this period is that what the Nixon administration was afraid of in Chile was not that he would take the country down some sort of a Stalinist path and and, and uh, implement rampant authoritarianism that would starve the people. They were very specifically, and they were very clear about this. They were they were afraid that Salvador Allende's democratic socialism would succeed, and by succeeding, serve as a inspiration to the other peoples of of South America. They they were terrified that if they if Allende proved that you could have socialism and democracy, then the game would be up. Then everybody would want to do this. There'd be no way to maintain hegemony in, in Latin America. So in 1970, before Allende even takes power, the U.S. starts backing right-wing terrorism. And the first major result of this terrorism is that the leader of the Chilean armed forces is kidnapped and murdered. And the reason he was kidnapped is because he was opposed to a Chilean coup. So he was seen as an obstacle to the, in the eyes of the right in the United States, a necessary step of stopping Allende from taking president, even though he even had, hadn't even had the chance to make a single mistake. Uh, Rene Schneider, this military leader, was killed. That, this was probably an accident. But the terrorism started before Allende even gets, to, gets, gets into office. But he does get into office. The first, the first attempts to stop him fail. And as Allende is running Chile, right-wing terrorists begin to graffiti the walls of Santiago, the capital, and they would write the message, Jakarta is coming, or just Jakarta, and they would send uh, postcards to members of the government or leftists or supporters of Salvador Allende that would say Jakarta is coming, or Jakarta. And what this meant, and it was clear if you were paying attention to the global Cold War at this point in history, was we're going to kill you just like they killed them in Indonesia. And this was terrifying, and, and, a, and I met a lot of the people in, in Chile that lived through this, that were threatened by this. Uh, it was terrorism, right? The idea was to send the message that you're going to die if you don't give us what we want. Even if we get what we want, we're probably going to kill you anyways. And in September 11th, 1973, Pinochet eventually succeeds in overthrowing the Allende government with the the active support of the CIA, of course. And on September 11, 1973, Jakarta does come. The message that had been sent years before um, was true. They killed the people that were seen as a threat to the consolidation of right-wing authoritarianism in Chile. Now, they didn't kill nearly as many people because they they didn't have to, and they were, and they were proud of the, the ways in which they were, say, surgical about the, the, the killings. They, they, they thought that uh, they could be efficient in, in, in killing only a few thousand. And it worked, right? So just as the United States let Indonesia totally get away with this, the, U the U.S. played defense for, for Chile. Now, in Brazil, you also had something called Operation Jakarta uh, that was discussed in the exact same period among the right-wing Brazilian military. Now, we're not sure if this was actually an, uh, an official formal title for an operation or if it was just sort of a thing that was thrown around in the barracks as a, as a threat, as a plan, but it ended up not happening, right? And this, there's reasons in Brazil that the church and human rights um, uh, movements react to the murder of a very famous journalist, Vladimir Herzog, in ways which probably stopped them from carrying out Oper Operation Jakarta if it was ever a real operation. But still, in 1975, these two U.S.-backed right-wing authoritarian regimes come together to form Operation Condor which is a international mass murder network. So just as um, I, uh, 
Pinochet had taken out his internal enemies in 1973, and just as Brazil had killed the people that it needed to uh, t- take care of in order to consolidate power in the late 60s and early 70s, they, the countries of the southern, southern cone, most of which by now were US-backed right-wing authoritarian regimes, realized, oh, well, what happens if one of our quote-unquote enemies gets away? They get across a border. And so they form Operation Condor, which is a collaboration to kill enemies of the regimes wherever they may be. And this is not like guerrillas, right? So Pinochet killed his former boss, right, in, in Buenos Aires. He was the, Pinochet killed um, Carlos Prats, who was the head, another head of the Chilean military that was morally and, and, uh, and politically against the idea of a coup. And Operation Condor countries killed tens of thousands of people in, in, in the years that came. And, and again, just as in Indonesia, they got away with this to the extent that the United States said anything about this. They came to their defense. And it worked, right? Like the consolidation of crony capitalism in the least in, – in, you know, in, in like – it's the opposite of the free market, right? It's, it's like – it's the kind of market that is imposed upon you by – you know, a violent dictatorship. Absolutely right. This is is the type of capitalism that is still in place in the vast majority of the developing world, I think. Right. And now, so I think people are probably more familiar with the coup in Chile and the CIA's involvement there. Um, but can you tell us the direct CIA involvement in the regime change in Brazil? Yeah, so João Goulart takes over in the beginning of the 1960s. This was kind of a mistake. He was only elected as vice president, but then the actual president resigns thinking that the people are going to like sweep into the streets or so like take to the streets and sweep them back into power. This doesn't happen. So it ends up with João Goulart, a left-wing president that does that is not seen as acceptable by the Brazilian elite. Now, in 1962, uh, John F. Kennedy has a meeting with his ambassador to Brazil, and you can listen to the recording of that meeting when John F. Kennedy tells him to prepare the ground for a military coup if it's needed to basically tell the, the Brazilian military that, you know, this is something you can look into, and if it turns out that you think it's necessary, if it turns out that fighting communism, quote-unquote, is going to take this path, we're going to have your back. This, of course, happens. They step up covert operations in Brazil. Uh, we don't know exactly what that meant, but the the explicit support for the Brazilian military and the explicit message, which is, if you need to find a way to get rid of this president, go for it. This happened from 1960 to 1964. Now, JFK also sends in Vernon Walters as his military attache to Brazil. And in the beginning of 1964, we now have declassified files that indi- that indicate that the U.S. foreign policy establishment is coalescing around a an option as a replacement for João Goulart. And that is uh, a military officer called General Humberto Castelo Branco. Now, General Humberto Castelo Branco is probably known to Brazilians as the first dictatorship, or as the first dictator to take power in the coup of 1964. What is very often overlooked by history is this, this general, Humberto Castelo Branco, is the former roommate of Vernon Walters, that military attaché that JFK sent in. They had lived together in Italy back in the 40s. So although the actual coup happens in a, in a in, in, and it's important to recognize how, how important this was for its long-term success, the coup is carried out by the Brazilian military. Uh, something called Operation Brother Sam. If you if you Google that, you can see the the declassified authorization of the supply of naval um, force to the Brazilian military. But that, that's not needed. The Brazilian military carries this out on its own. And part of the reason it's so successful is because the actual president, João Goulart, thinks that this is going to be temporary. He thinks it's, this dictatorship is going to just last a, a couple of years and he's going to be able to run for president again or that cons- the, the, the democracy will be reconsolidated. Of course, this doesn't happen. So it is, for this reason, I think the most successful and um, long-lasting intervention uh, in the Western Hemisphere in the 20th century. And Brazil becomes one of the, a very, not only... Uh, 
compliant but enthusiastic anti-communist partner in South America. So they end up um, actively intervening and interfering in Bolivia, Uruguay, and then eventually Chile to make sure that other social democratic or left-leaning or just, they, I mean, the, the elites were here were just afraid of democracy, right? I mean, one of the worst things that Joao Goulart was proposing was um, voting rights reform in a way that, you know, is very familiar to what was happening in the United States at the exact same period. He was trying to extend the vote to black Brazilians who were excluded from uh, democracy by literacy uh, laws, right? And the elites recognized that this would have entirely changed the the the, the dynamic of, of politics in, in South America and in Brazil's U.S.-backed dictatorship from 1964 to 1973, four, five, is actively intervening in the smaller countries around here to make sure that they also become U.S.-backed anti-communist dictatorships. Mm -hmm. And in Brazil, how many people were rounded up and killed? Or Way rounded up and or killed, I guess, two different questions there. Way less than in the neighboring countries. So if you can, if you uh, if you count the disappeared, the actual people, uh, the people that in Brazilian cities were identifiably taken prisoner and never got back out, it's around 400. Now, if you want to expand that number to all of the indigenous people that might have that have been killed very far from the media, the number is a lot higher, but. The, the number of actual murders carried out intentionally by the Brazilian military is very small compared to, say, Argentina, where there's tens of thousands, Chile, where there's 3,000, all of Operation Condor, so this, all of the, the countries that, that form part of this, this um, coalition in South America kill maybe 70 to 90,000 people mm. in, in the 70s and 80s. And then there's a direct line from this up into Central America. And because when Central America becomes the next quote unquote problem area for US hegemony, when left leaning reformists start to take power and then they are killed, and then that leads to the left reforming into guerrilla groups in Central America, Operation Condor Brazil or military officers come into Central America to train right wing death squads in Central America. And the worst violence. Um, in the Western Hemisphere in the Cold War happens in Guatemala, where 200 to 250,000 innocent people were executed for being quote-unquote communists, often just for being indigenous, because the indigenous, depending on your tribe, were seen as inherently, in, in, a, in, in a very racist way, they were sort of, that tribe was marked as communist, right? Like, oh, that tribe is opposed to the type of market that we want to impose on them, so they need to be eliminated. 250,000 in Guatemala would be 70,000 in El Salvador. Of course, the the Contra War is more famous in in on Guatemala. Uh, I mean that the civil war there lasted for what 20 or 30 years or something. No, it lasted from well, we the United States overthrew Huckabarbins in 1954. Uh -huh. Things were a mess from then until 2000. The cold, the the actual civil war, the actual civil war started in 1960, and so it went on for at least 30 years, and that the the civil war was, you know, in Guatemala, the long consequences of the 1954 CIA coup uh, were catastrophic until until basically the beginning of the 21st century. And if anybody anybody you talk to in Guatemala has some kind of a story of of the way in this what this affected their lives. And, you know, we talked about earlier, like, you know, in the CIA saw this as a quote unquote success since yeah. 54. And this is very tragic and awful. But by the end of the 50s, they realized, oh, this didn't actually work so well. Um, we need to come up with more subtle and more lasting ways to uh, exercise hegemony. But it, the actual civil war started in 1960. And this is often forgotten. The proximate cause, I mean, the real deep causes for the civil war was that there was a dictatorship with absolutely no popular support. But the proximate cause for the beginning of the, of the Civil War in 1960 was that the Cuban exiles that were training for the Bay of Pigs were being trained in Guatemala. And their presence on Guatemalan soil really upset the Guatemalan military because the, the actual dictator was taking all the money and these Cubans were sort of throwing their weight around in a way which was insulting to the Guatemalans. And they didn't, they didn't agree with 
the use of Guatemalan soil for the training of Bay of Pigs forces. And this was the beginning of the rebellion against the, the, the Guatemalan dictator. This was the, 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 the spark that set off the, the fire that raged for 30 years. I see. So in other words, that's what really made it a civil war was a split inside the military, not just the government versus the Indians, but right. yeah, on the, first, the Indian side, there were some with power, too. So the first in Guatemala, the first rebel group was former military officers that were left compared to the 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 leader of the country. So they split off in 1960 and formed a guerrilla group that was opposed to the dictatorship. And then there, you had successive waves of guerrilla groups in Guatemala that were trying to knock off the dictatorship that was controlling things in Guatemala City. Now, in the late 70s, you had the rise of a new, dicta uh, sorry, a new guerrilla group that was inspired by the tactics of Mao, and their, and their job was to try to get the indigenous on their side. And although this didn't quite work, the fact that they even tried to do so, that the fact that they even went into indigenous areas and said, hey, 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 we're fighting for you, we want you to support us, that led the indigenous to be marked for extermination by the central government. So yeah. in my book... Also, um, it shows that they weren't already with the communists in the first place if the communists oh, were no. coming to them asking for support. Oh, no, they had very... I mean, I, in, in my book, at, at the end of the... At the, towards the end, I, I spent a lot of time in Guatemala in one of these communities that was totally desecrated, and two things really pop out. The first is that they... The, yeah, these guerrillas came, and they were like, oh, yeah, we're going to fight for you. Uh, are you on our side? And, and they were kind of like, I don't know, like, well, you know, they, they, they treated them with, like, the basic politeness and hospitality that they would treat anybody that was not an enemy, Right. But then that was that that was enough to mark them for extermination. And they but they didn't really understand exactly what this guerrilla group was all about, except for that, you know, they were against the government. And number two, these communities in Central America and the one that I visited in in the highlands of Guatemala are still decimated to this day. And the only source of income that the village that I visited has is they send their kids to sneak into the United States and learn Spanish because they don't even know – they have to learn Spanish in the United States because they don't speak Spanish in these parts of the Guatemalan highlands to send back their – a little bit of money to rebuild these communities which were devastated by the U.S.-backed military in the 1980s. Oh, man. All right. Now, I'm curious. Do you have a chapter in your book about the Baathists in Iraq and the CIA helping them hunt down and murder all their leftists and academics too? Yes, I do. So great. That is man. I gotta get this book. Uh, yeah, uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> I hope you do, and I hope, hope other people do as well. So the the Indonesian massacre of 1965, 1966 is, we believe, to the best of our knowledge, the third time that the United States or the CIA hand over lists of communists so that that local partners can have them executed. So the first is in 1954 in Guatemala. The uh, ambassador to Guatemala orders the new Guatemalan government to kill very specific communists. And then in 1963, you have the Ba'ath coup, which is backed uh, very likely. Uh, we don't know to what extent it was planned or backed, but certainly uh, had the uh, support of the CIA by the by the time everything was done. And in 1963, um, we believe that the CIA did hand over lists of quote-unquote communists for the Ba'ath Party to execute. Now, I interviewed um, an Iraqi who lived through this, who was in the Iraqi Communist Party, you know, lives in London. He was forced out of the country by the, the invasion in 2003. And, and he said that Saddam Hussein in 1963 had a reputation for being one of the most brutal and ruthless of the torturers and murderers carrying out this anti-communist purge um, in the Ba'ath Party. Mm -hmm. So again, this is again, it's 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 often very forgotten. It's often forgotten, but in the middle of the 20th century, the largest communist parties in the world, uh, outside of you know, in the in the in the quote unquote third world or in the in the Bandung nations, were the number one, the Indonesian Communist Party, number two, the Iraqi Communist Party, and number three, the Sudanese Communist Party. All three of these communist parties were literally exterminated through mass murder. And um, 
you know, this was a party that really had a lot of influence in, 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 in Iraq. I mean, the, the idea that is often held in post 9-11 um, in the United States in, after 9-11 that the Middle East is a sort of uh, rabidly religious and conservative place would have been completely unrecognizable to people who lived through the 50s and 60s and 70s where the, where the, the Muslim left was very powerful. Mm -hmm. And America and Britain backed the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, any kind of Islamists they could as long as they would oppose socialism and nationalism. Yeah, this was a huge, a huge part of the the U.S. Yeah, U.S. support for uh, Muslim parties, if not Islamists. You know, the most famous, of course, is in Afghanistan. But you had this throughout all of the um, Arab world. So Nasser uh, was uh, a sort of a left leaning leader of Egypt, which I, uh, you know, was part of this constellation of left leaning anti imperialist. Not communist, but you know, uh, and you know, um, opposed to conservative Islam. Uh, Sukarno is probably the most important and famous example of the example of this. Sukarno was a Muslim, and you know, in one sense, but he was absolutely not a conservative. And uh, and then this uh, this is also very um, important to understand the rise of. Uh, U.S. support for Saudi Arabia and for the influence of Wahhabism as a strand of Islam in general. And uh, Vijay Prashad does a really good job in his book, The Darker Nations, of, of, of showing how the all the money and, and resources that were pumped into Wahhabism were a, were a kind of an anti-Bandung, a desperate attempt to counter the Bandung idea of um, third world, left-leaning, identity yeah robert drives's book devil's game is also really great on the entire cold war history of u.s support for islamist parties mm -hmm. uh shia and sunni and wahhabi and whatever you got as long as they're not nationalists or leftists yeah and, and in in indonesia this was i said the first attempt that um the u.s uh this was the first u.s attempt to stop the rise of the left in indonesia to keep Sukarno down and to stop the rise of the Communist Party was that they pumped all this money into this party called Masyumi, which was a right-wing uh, conservative Muslim party. And at the Bandung conference, uh, an American named uh, Richard Wright, who wrote Native Son, he was, uh, he was an important black author in the middle of the 20th century, he talked to these conservative Muslims in, in Indonesia being like, Oh, so what do you, you know, how do you understand your alliance with the United States? And and these are the guys that are getting CIA money, and they're saying, look, they don't understand who we are. They're not really our friends. They, and they, they, they tell him something like, if the only basis for a partnership is that we're the the people that they can pick that are not communists, that's not the that's not the basis for a long term friendship. And even us, even those, even we who are receiving direct funding are not trustful of what Washington is really doing here. It's, it's, they, all they're doing is finding somebody to oppose their enemies rather than understanding the country well enough to develop it in, in a positive way. Mm. Uh, what are you worried about? Some stirred up Muslims, man. What, what harm could they be? Yeah, exactly. You know, and, you know, arguably, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, scholars of the Cold War often step back and say, you know, the Soviet Union filled a sort of structural role in, in U.S. foreign policy the second half of the 20th century, and lo and behold, Mus uh, you know, radical Islam or terrorism falls right back into that exact same role, and the United States ends up treating, quote-unquote, terrorism the same way that it treated, quote-unquote, communism in the second half of the 20th century, or anything that kind of even smelled uh, a little bit like communist had no human rights, and this is, you know, this led to the, yeah. uh, the, the mass murder in 65, 66 in, in Indonesia, and then after 9-11, anybody that could even be halfway considered somehow a terrorist or the kind of Muslim that could be a terrorist didn't have human rights either. Right. Um, yeah, and of course, the stirred up Muslims, uh, quote, paraphrase there, that's Zbigniew Brzezinski, who would help launch the project to support the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in the Carter years, talking about, yeah, but who cares about that compared to the fall of the Soviet Union? Yeah, it's from 98, so it was... Before 9-11, but it was after Kobar Towers and the Africa embassies. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, yeah.
And he was still saying, come on, truck bomb here, truck bomb there. How does that compare to what we were trying to do? Yeah, yeah. I always yeah. thought when uh, Gary Johnson had his Aleppo moment on Morning Joe that instead of saying, what's Aleppo, he should have said, well, see, it all started when your father embarked on this project, Mika, back in 1979 and just taken the argument from there. But Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, that yeah, would have I mean, been it's... one for the ages. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's just, I mean, that's, it's, that's the blowback thesis, right? That is it always, you know, you can't, <laughs> if you just throw support behind anybody that's not enemy number one, once enemy number one is gone, there's going to be enemy number two. And it's just, it's an, un, it's an unending cycle, right? You're always, you're always going to be, and you're generating the countervailing forces that end up being the next big enemy forever. Yep. Hey, there was a big knife attack in Britain by a Libyan national who I hadn't seen the details yet, but I bet you dollars to donuts. He's tied to the Libyan Islamic fighting group, just like the Manchester attacker, useful yeah. to the CIA and the MI6. You know, they try to use these guys. I'm sure you wrote about this. Uh, they tried to use LIFG against Gaddafi back in the 90s. And yeah. then call that off and make Gaddafi an ally, and then eh, they went ahead and sided with the terrorists against him again. Yeah, I, um, yeah, well, you don't hear about Libya too much for some reason uh, these days. Yeah, Stop well, they blew about the that. opportunity that we gave right. them, is what Hillary Clinton said. Oh yeah, right. I know. I was, uh, you know, yeah. I, <laughs> I was. I studied in London in that little period where you said that Gaddafi was a uh, was an ally because. I was studying at the London School of Economics, and so was his son. His son was a, uh, like... Which one, safe? I don't know. It's a good question. Okay. But I know that it, it was he was famous around campus for not... He wouldn't come. He would send a note-taker. But it was like... I think it ended up being that the... I mean, don't quote me. Well, you know, look it up. But I believe that the the head of the school, London School of Economics, had to step down because of the links to Gaddafi. When, when Gaddafi switched back to being a bad guy... Anyone that had sort of been friendly with the family in that brief interlude uh, had to had to sort of take a hit for it. Amazing stuff. And then, yeah, I mean, with the Manchester attacker, it turned out that his family was directly tied to the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group and MI6 efforts. And after their, you know, temporary alliance earlier on, the first phase of it, they'd been resettled in Manchester. And then when 2011 broke out, they went ahead, MI6 rounded all these guys up and sent them off to fight. And then it was actually uh, Her Majesty's Royal Navy had given the Manchester bomber a ride back to England from North Africa. I think he had stopped in Syria where he was a moderate rebel for a time. And oh, then yeah, they brought him yeah. back to England where he slaughtered rebels. a bunch of little children at a rock concert. Yeah, I remember the moderate rebels. That was a big thing to the quote unquote moderate rebels from in Syria. Yeah. All you had, I mean, yeah, all you had to do to be, to be moderate was... was to be a right of our, wing death squad be leader, en- yeah. yeah. To be to be an enemy of our enemy for now, and you know, yeah. if you were, I'm sure if they were had to have succeeded in taking over, then they would have had to become the enemy again. Just yeah. you know, the cycle. And again, in favor of the Islamists against the secularists, which say whatever you want about the Baathists, but they protect all the different religious minorities and and ethnic minorities, and yeah, well, don't want well, to the, go back in time to some previous century, unlike you know the leaders of Al Nusra. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is just like, this is a, a, a truism that somehow we forget over and over in U.S. foreign policy. Just because something's bad doesn't mean it can't get worse, right? So the the leadership of Saddam Hussein, however awful it was, like, you can always make it worse. There's no reason to believe that just, like, throwing Western money and, and military power around is going to automatically lead from bad to good. It could lead from bad to very, very bad. Yeah. You know, I never could find this in the Google anymore, but I did see it on TV where a Republican congressman, I don't remember the name or the channel, but it was a cable TV news channel. Uh, and, and he was being interviewed about and, and was taking the McCain position on the intervention in Syria. And they asked the smart question, OK, so if we do overthrow the Baathist government there in Damascus, then what's going to happen after that? Who's going to take power after that? And what's that going to look like? And he says, well, we just have to hope that someone comes to the fore. Yeah. And then that was it. (laughs) Comes to the fore. Like, what a weird old-fashioned way to say, I have no idea. How dare you ask me that question? I think think it's kind of deeply embedded in our our sort of consciousness, this sort of 
not hang, hangover is the wrong word because it's the opposite of a hangover, but like the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was just the idea that like, oh yeah, if you just like get rid of the bad thing, then the good thing happens. And in the case of East Germany, that is actually what happened, right? Like you just, you had West Germany come in and say, okay, East Germany, you're going to join our country. And, and the fall of the Soviet Union, this very specific and very well publicized chapter of the Cold War, something did come to the fore, right? But in the vast majority of the world, if you just destroy something that exists, there is not a magical process that generates a better thing. You know, if you have a car that doesn't work that well, but you shoot it with a bazooka, there's not a magically generated better car that comes out of the process. And, and but somehow I think we believe that all, you know, in Venezuela, I mean, I, I lived in Venezuela at the beginning of my journalism career. And uh, over the years, the, that government has been either, you know, a little bit bad or very bad. But again, that doesn't mean that just sort of throwing stuff at it and, and destroying it will lead to something better. It could lead to a civil war. It could lead to a very horrible, you know, or it could lead to just a decade of this kind of stalemate that we have until now. Um, yeah, it's a strange, it's a strange pathology we have to the, anytime you oppose an intervention, you say, well, do you, I mean, you like that government? It's like, no, I just think that it's not necessarily going to get better if you throw U.S. power at it. Sure. Well, and of course, got no right whatsoever. In fact, even under the constitutional law, the national government is bound, and it's kind of vague, that they are bound to guarantee a Republican form of government to every state in the union, which I guess means that if the Reds took over New Mexico, then the federal government would claim the constitutional authority to go in there and make sure they have a bicameral legislature and an independent judiciary or something. Okay, fine. But then, by stark relief, that proves that they don't have anything like the right to do that to any state in the world, just right. members of the union who signed on to this constitution. Right, right, right. So, but anyway, never mind that. Like the constitution has anything to do with anything, but anyway. Now, yeah, foreign policy tends to be uh, an extra legal space, right? I mean, international law, to the extent that it exists, can be usually avoided when the powerful, when the interests are powerful enough, but... Uh, domestically, it's a little bit different, but internationally, it's you could usually find a way to do whatever you want. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, um, again, this is such an important article alone here. Um, never mind even the book. Uh, NewYorkBooks.com. No, sorry. NYBooks.com. How Jakarta became the code word for U.S.-backed mass killing. How do you like that? Uh, New York Review of Books. And then uh, the brand new book out is The Jakarta Method. Washington's anti-communist crusade and the mass murder program that shaped our world. Thanks very much for your time again, Vincent. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Sure. What I was saying is that in, in the Cold War, there were actual socialist movements like Allende was. There were actual communist movements like you had in Indonesia. But in a lot of the cases, the communist brush was used to paint governments which were just trying to implement capitalism for the first time in in these nations. So for example, in Guatemala, Jacobo Arbenz, what he was trying to do was implement a land reform which would end feudal control of Guatemala and allow it to be developed, allow the, for, the forces of the market to develop capitalism for the first time. And this is what he said he wanted to do, and he wasn't lying, this is what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. The reason that this was a big problem for the United States is because the United Fruit Company controlled the vast majority uh, of land in Guatemala, and they had been lying about how much the land was worth. So when he tried to compensate that company for their uh for the land reform it the the amount they were going to get was nothing compared to what it was actually worth because they were lying about it in iran what they wanted was to have iranian control of oil and like yeah in 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 a lot of cases it was the transition from imperial or colonial feudalism to capitalism Right. That was in other that words, was they were just declaring independence. Right. They were not the really uh, leftist regime. And by the way, you know, Murray Rothbard and Sheldon Richmond and all the great libertarians are uh, supportive of land reform when it's, you know, ancient imperial edicts from the king of Spain or whoever that granted these land titles to these feudal lords when, you know, we're John Lockeans. It's yeah. the people who work that land that own that land. And the really interesting thing is that if you look at the countries where the United States really wanted capitalism to take off, Japan and South Korea, land reform did take place under 
the aegis of the United States in the first years of of the Cold War. So when countries that were seen as sort of outside or a threat to U.S. hegemony tried to do what the South Koreans or, the, or, or, the, or what we had done really in Japan and South Korea, that was seen as quote unquote communism. And all it was was really, as you say, tr transferring this feudal control of land in Latin America and Asia mm -hmm. to a modern market economy. And, and in Brazil, this was, this was I, I mentioned um, voting rights for black people. Mm -hmm. The other thing that really horrified the Brazilian elites was that Jean Goulart wanted to carry out land reform. And to this day, I mean, this is something that I've, I've in other through. words, property rights for black people was the problem that the American government yeah, full, right was intervening yeah. to help solve. Yeah. Full citizenship, full, uh -huh. full liberal citizenship, the control, uh, you know, like modern capitalist property rights rather than feudal property rights and, and voting for everyone. And like, I, you know, I've lived through this in very tragic ways. Like, the Amazon is still under feudal control. Like I had a contact that used to work in Brazil's environmental enforcement agency that took me on tours of the Amazon and showed me exactly who destroyed it and for what reason. Uh, I mean, I stayed in contact with him afterwards on, um, uh, after, as I left the country and then he was killed. Uh, they, his, his plane was blew up. It was, was, was exploded in the Amazon. So like we still have feudal control over much of South America. And this was what was stopped by the quote unquote anti-communist mm -hmm. crusade as well. And you know what? Let me bring up the Rockefellers again, because, uh, I mean, this is especially when you're talking about the 60s and 70s. This is the heyday of David Rockefeller and the Chase Manhattan Bank and their global interests. And they really were getting dirty work done everywhere. And I know that in and you know, Nelson Rockefeller and other members of the family as well, but that they had these very strong alliances with the Catholic Church and with all these right-wing governments um, and for a variety of interests, not just oil, but agriculture and all kinds of different things. And I wonder if you have sort of a comment on that particular, you know, line of uh, argument here. I think it's, I mean, I, yeah, I just, I would just think it's right. I mean, so... Um, yeah, the, so David Rockefeller was part of this first big business conference that I told you about that took place in Indonesia as a million people were still in concentration camps purely for their political beliefs. And he, he gave the final speech at this sort of, you know, at the, I don't know, whatever it was, the Hilton Jakarta or something, some sort of fancy dinner for American businessmen. And he, and he surveys what's happening in Indonesia. And he said, oh, I've talked to a good many people over the course of the last couple of days, and I have found universal enthusiasm. And, that, you know, that's enthusiasm for the creation, for the system that was created by, you know, just, you know, months previously, rounding up a million people, stabbing them, throwing them into the river to the point where a third of the country is too terrified to ever talk about what happened. And to this day, and he was very encouraged by by the opportunities that, that provided to to him and other U.S. businessmen. Yeah. And then, and, you know, there's this book, Thy Will Be Done, by uh, Colby and I think Bennett. Um, that's about the alliance between the Chase Bank and, and other Rockefeller interests and the Catholic Church throughout Latin America. Um, although I got to admit, it's been about 20 years since I looked at the thing. Um but I wonder if you know much about that. I know, I, and I don't. I don't go into this deeply in uh, in Brazil, but I know that the the Rockefellers were quite active in the in the run up to the 1964 coup, and then certainly in Chile. So right, and people can read in, about that in Trilateralism by Holly Sklar, makes mm -hmm. all the direct connections there to the Chile coup. And then in Chile, so I I, I worked with a researcher in Santiago to really trace where this quote unquote Jakarta um, metaphor came from. And we found the first articles that ever spoke about the deployment of quote unquote Jakarta during this terror campaign in 1972. And in one of the articles we found, they said that plan Jakarta quote unquote had been handed to the, the Chilean military by David Rockefeller. So we don't know if that's true, but we know that that's what the Chilean left was claiming at the time. So the people that were being terrorized by the Jakarta, um, by this Jakarta graffiti campaign, believed at the time that David Rockefeller had given that plan to the Pinochetistas. Yeah. I'll tell you what, man, I sure am behind on my uh, history of Latin American intervention. <laughs>
and uh, I sure do need to catch up, and this looks like a great place to start. So once again, really appreciate it, Vincent. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A., APSradio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.